Is your family tree a mystery? Are you fascinated by genealogy? Well, hip, hip, hooray, let's talk DNA with Julie. The truth is in your genes. In Cut-Off Genes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Cut-Off Genes, the podcast that helps you find your truth using nothing but DNA. I'm Julie Dixon-Jackson, and I am a genetic genealogist, henceforth known as a Gen Genie. And I am Richard Castle, the producer and co-host of this podcast. How are you, Julie? I'm swell, Richard. How <laughs> I, are you? I'm swell. <laughs> <laughs> Things are just rosy. <laughs> I took the time to put lipstick on for you, but did not run a comb through my hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good look. I like it. You get the shabby chic look. <laughs> There's no chic. It's just shabby. Hey, did you have uh, did you have a power outage for most of the day Monday? I did not. We did have some, our lights flickered a bit because it was super windy. We had the um, Santa Ana winds, oh, right? Oh, lights flickered a bit. Poor thing. Okay, well, on this side of the street, because you're on the other side of a, of a main drag, uh, apparently some power lines went down, and we had nothing from 8 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. Oh, wow. And you would think that the world had ended for me because... <laughs> I didn't know what to do if I couldn't cook something or watch something or it was, I I, I was beside myself. We are so (laughs) dependent on electricity and all our little devices. It's incredible. Well, and then my dryer broke, which is still broken, by the way. So I had to schlep to a laundromat yesterday to dry my socks because that was the one load I decided to find every single sock in the house and wash and then uh whatever didn't have a match i was gonna throw away (laughs) so i literally had a ton of wet socks in the house it's a full life isn't it julie it really is it really is talk about first world problems jeez hey julie i read Mm -hmm. there's a little um update on one of our stories that e jean carroll Oh, um, yes. She was suing um, the president, oh, and yeah. apparently the um, Justice Dis- Department wasn't going to allow that to go through because right. they were going to defend the president. Right, um, for something person- that happened long before his presidency. Yes, and I just read that a, a um, federal court overturned that, and they're not allowed to do, do that, and she can move forward with her um, what was Bergdorf it? Goodman. Bergdorf's. <laughs> This is like a Sue Grafton novel. B is for Bergdorf. Oh, I see what you did there. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, there was another update, actually, that you sent me regarding uh, Delphine Boel, right? Yes, yes. Who was the biological daughter of the former king of Belgium. Yes. Um, we talked remember? about that several times, yes, right? Yes, and so she was suing him for acknowledgement. Yeah. Basically, she, her mother she had... She didn't a, want the money. She didn't want money. No. Nope. She just wanted an acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. And so there was a... They finally had a meeting, apparently, and our, uh, and she now has a right to use the title princess. Wow. Because yeah. he was uh, king at the time. You know, some of us have been using that title without, without the right. So true. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Unofficial, unofficial princess, unofficial <laughs> queen, unofficial diva. Sure, you know Unof- my daughter. Uh, uh, one year for Halloween, she I I dressed her as a princess. Um, when she was a toddler, and we would trick or treat, and everywhere she would go, people would say, "Oh, look at the little princess!" And her response was, "Actually, I'm a queen." <laughs> That's my girl. <laughs> yep. Does she remember that? Probably. I don't know. I bet it pretty much says it all for my wow. daughter. <laughs> well, uh, because it is almost Halloween, I'll tell this story. Oh, and do I, tell. Forgive me if I had told you this, but I remember when I was a little kid, and I loved The Wizard of Oz, right? Mm-hmm. So I wanted to go as the Wicked Witch. Uh-huh. And um, I remember saying to my mom, I want, oh, I want to go as the, the Wicked Witch of the West this year. And my, my oldest brother said to me, he's like, Rich, you can't go as that. That's that's only for girls. And my mother, God rest her soul, said he can go as anything he wants. Yay, Irene. <laughs> Until she found out that I would be dressed in all black uh-huh. and she was afraid that I would get hit by a car on Halloween. Oh. <laughs> so I had to go as Luke Skywalker dressed in all white. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, that's fantastic. You could have had glow in the dark green makeup. Not enough. Yeah, Not enough for Irene. No. It, one thing to support that I wanted to go as a witch, it's another thing that let I might end up, you know, harming myself or you being know harmed. What? That's the kind of mother we all need. So, yeah, Halloween is this week. Uh, I don't care. We're ignoring it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, and also I want to just tell everybody, um, it's also, this will drop before the election. So please, everybody, vote. It is a very important election. We're not a political podcast, but that it's not political to say that, please, if you're in the United States and you're yep. a citizen and you're eligible to vote, that your voice needs to be heard. Exercise regardless. your right. Exactly. Here's uh, something that I just found. Um, So the Trump administration administration says it can't reunite missing migrant children with their families. Yes. Um, Because it can't find them, apparently. Uh, It sounds like a job for Julie. Yes, it does. (laughs) Instead, many of the children are being funneled through Christian adoption trafficking mills like the DeVos-connected Bethany Christian Services. So... Here's the deal. Uh, The administration argued in court earlier this week that reuniting migrant children separated from their parents at the border would require too much effort and would present grave child welfare concerns as the child would be traumatized by leaving their current sponsor's homes. Mm, Let that sink in. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I don't know where to begin with that. I know. Though the concerns for the psychological well-being of the children are specious at best, considering the original trauma was inflicted by the administration, the situation has a second nefarious element. Many of these children are being sent to a Christian agency with ties uh, to Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. Yes. Um, Yeah, that's, yeah. So the progressive secular humanist um, did a little research on this and... Uh, there's no question that Bethany Christian Services has quite a few ties to the DeVos family. Um, It's undeniable. Tax filings archived by ProPublica show that between 2001 and 2015, the Dick and Betsy DeVos Foundation, um, the organization run by DeVos and her husband, gave $343,000 in grants to Bethany Christian Services. Between 2012-2015, they received $750,000 in grants from the Richard and Helen DeVos Foundation, her in-laws, um, he is the billionaire founder of Amway. I don't know if you knew that. I did not know that. Well, now you do. It sounds to me like a big conflict of interest no matter what. I mean, regardless yeah. of whether it would be government or business that, you know, you're sort of making money off of. It's really ugly. I don't yeah. know. It makes me, gives me the icky wicky feeling. Like, I don't like that. Yeah. Well, and it's even, I mean, it's even more than that. The fact that, you know, trauma inflicted on children of any age being um, ripped from their parents is uh, is a, a, a wound, is a eternal wound, and it never goes away. Um, so for them to be now pretending to take the high road uh, and pretending to be worried about the well-being of these children is um, uh, not surprising. <laughs> I'm going to say it. I fear for the um, for their future and for mm-hmm. ours because those kids will grow up to be adults and God knows what those wounds will make, how they will um, come out later in life. Uh, you, know? you know, yes. And there, I don't, I don't care what your personal experience has been uh, with adoption. Um, there's overwhelming evidence that the practice of being taken from uh, your comfort zone at any age is uh, has been proven to have lifelong effects on on us. And I, by us, I mean adoptees and people who were uh, not with our biological families. It's an American tragedy is what this is. It really I mean, is. Re- it really is. It's it really a big, is. big mess up. And yeah. um, the, the fact that we could even say, oh, we can't find the parents now, that there had never been any kind of mechanism in place to somehow yeah. keep in touch with the parents that they were removed from is beyond, it's beyond the pale. You know, no. I can't yeah. even it's beyond. fathom. 
So in uh, her 2013 book, The Child Catchers, Rescue Trafficking and the New Gospel of Adoption, Catherine Joyce documents this alarming trend of conservative Christians adopting children, remove them from natural parents via nefarious means to feed the business of Christian adoption and serve the agenda of Christian theocracy. Now, this is, this is not anti-Christian. I know that there are many, many Christian organizations um, that have the best, the, the people's best interests at heart. Of course. Um, but it reeks of indoctrination and trafficking, well. frankly. On Tuesday night, the Daily Beast reported that the threat of adoption has become weaponized as a Guatemalan mother detained by Customs and Border Protection earlier this month was allegedly presented with the ultimatum that if she didn't abandon her asylum appeal, uh, she would be jailed for a year and her daughter put up for adoption. Bethany's director of refugee and foster care programs, Donna Abbott, said last year that it was too early to say whether these children will be available for adoption at all. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So um, that's uh, that's horrific, right? Let's hope that we can um, learn from our mistakes. <laughs> Please. Please maybe learn. Well, you know, I'll, I'll to bring it all back to, a, I don't want to know if this is lighter, but it's certainly on the subject. I started watching this really good show on Netflix called The Queen's Gambit. Have you heard of it? Yeah. Anyway, it's about a, a, a young woman who's a champion chess player. And I believe uh-huh. it takes place, well, uh, partly in the 60s, but it flashes back to when she was a child and she was an orphan. Her mother was was killed and she was she went to like a, an all-girls uh, orphanage where mm-hmm. she lived in a sort of dorm-style t- um, room and all of that. And um, it's fascinating to see because the, there's a scene where she's, I don't think I'm, ruining anything no spoilers but there's a there's a scene where she's in line and they're handing her um handing out tranquilizers <gasps> to the girls like oh. all of them every one of these kids were, were on tranquilizers yeah just they wanted to control to, them right and then then there's a scene later where we she she's sort of addicted to them and <sighs> they the there's been a new law that's been passed where they they have to stop giving them tranquilizers because of course it's ridiculous but mm-hmm. she's addicted to them it's yeah. incredible i thought I looked it up. Is this true? It sure is. Oh, I'm sure it, it sure is. It sure is. I'm sure it is. Wow. Yeah. And it wasn't given to her specifically because she had a problem, you know, she she was yeah. manic or anything. It was, it was just they gave it to all of the kids to sort of keep them right. even Right, so that they would all just healed. be kind of yes. in a fog. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Just, it, yeah. So, you know, we look at that now and we go, that's ridiculous. How did that happen? I'm hoping, I mean, I, we, you and I right now and many, many people look at the, the children being separated from their parents at the border and go, oh, this is ridiculous. Hopefully in the future, that will be sort of the consensus that I don't know anybody today that is saying, you know, we should, have, we should still be giving our kids tranquilizers. Yeah, so we should definitely that we, do that. Yeah. That, the, that progress is made. And yeah. people get on the same page of what is moral and what is right. Agreed. And on that note, shall we break? Let's take a break. All right. If you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. Or consider supporting us on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash cutoff jeans podcast. Now back to Julie and me. Okay, we're back. Hello. Hey, remember, remember we used to have something called the book nook? Yes. <laughs> that kind of fell by the wayside, didn't it? Um, so yeah, like a year ago, probably more than a year ago, I started reading this book called The Most Dangerous Animal of All by Gary L. Stewart. Um, and I'm, I'm a slightly obsessed with true crime and even more obsessed, obviously, with unknown parentage. Um, and this book was about, written by an adoptee who, in finding out who his biological parents were, he believed he'd uncovered that his father was the Zodiac Killer. Well, I remember this, yes. And I started reading it, and it was, it was um, compelling, to say the least. Uh, his examples uh, and coincidences and... Um, Evidence was uh, seemed to point clearly in that direction, but I I knew and by by you know researching a little bit I knew that the case had not been solved, so I knew there must be something amiss. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Um, and even, and so since then, so I stopped reading it because I felt like I was wasting my time and I had other things to do. Um, but I was still interested. Mm -hmm. Uh, since then I've had a client who, uh, a high, one of her higher matches, it's still not that high on that particular line. I think it's the paternal line is Stephen Hodell. And I think I've mentioned this before. He was the son of Dr. George Hodell, who Stephen himself uh, believes that George Hodel was the Black Dahlia murderer. Oh, okay. okay. And there's been several movies about it, and uh, it's pretty compelling as well. Um, and I went to Stephen, after I saw him as a DNA match, I went to his site, and he also believes that his father was the Zodiac Killer. Oh, wow. Right. I mean... So, <laughs> right. So, and I, and he has a lot of evidence laid out on his website that I have not had a chance to fully uh, look at. That's so, one busy father. <laughs> that is one. Well, yeah, he was prolific, let's say. Um, so I was like, okay, so he thinks it was him and he thinks it was him and nobody says it's solved. So what's the dealio? So uh, notice that there was a documentary series on FX. Right. And it was called The Most Dangerous Animal of All. And it was basically the documentary about the guy that wrote the book, the adoptee yes. that wrote the book. And I was like, okay, well, let's see, you know. The, the it's book easy you had not finished. To, that I had not finished. Yes. And I wanted to see where it went. Yeah. Okay. So I started reading it. I mean, I started watching it. Um, and it sucked me in. And, and uh, mostly in the first episode, it was so relatable because – he basically talked about what it's like to be an adoptee and how it affected him. And uh, it was very um, raw and relatable as an adoptee. And it really, so that in and of itself was compelling to me. Mm -hmm. um, so as the series went on, uh, I was buying it. It was revealed that he had a ghostwriter who was a known uh, mystery novelist working with him that prides herself on research and and citing facts and it wasn't sue graft and z is for zodiac no it was not <laughs> sue graft and b is for bergdorf goodman's and z is for zodiac <laughs> uh, s is for shut up uh kidding <laughs> kidding um, oh uh, touche i love it <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh and so i was buying it the zodiac used to send ciphers. He was obviously, he obviously wanted a lot of attention and he used to send ciphers to uh, newspapers that then would turn it over to the police, but they would also print them um, that were uh, coded. And somewhere in the evidence, he was from a family, the, the father had been supposedly from a family that uh like his father was a decoder or something. And okay. so that kind of tied in with everything. Sure. Um, and in this one cipher, he had deciphered actually his father's full name by going down each row and finding the initials. And his name was spelled backwards across this cif cipher and uh, like in order. Wow. So it was pretty compelling. Then towards the last two episodes, there started being questions and you could see them being questioned by uh, the filmmakers about certain inconsistencies, I guess I want to say. And they presented it on camera to the writer himself or the son himself and also to the ghostwriter. And it seems like a lot of what was additionally thought of as fact, like a lot of the coincidences, actually weren't. And they were just convenient things that fit in the narrative, such as one of the murders uh, in San Francisco of a cab driver was happened two blocks from where the father had lived. Upon further research, they realized, yeah, he lived there uh, two blocks from there, but there's no evidence that he lived there during that time. All right. So that is far less compelling, I yes. guess. There were also a few other things. Did they rename the book F is for fake? <laughs> P is for phony. No. <laughs> it's, right. So in the final episode, say, so they basically called them both on it. And the writer was 
mad Ooh. that this had happened and she did some own re- her own and she followed up and she interviewed some of the people who had given some of the information he said he had gotten and it had been misconstrued and it was it, it just seemed more like a narrative than facts um and in the end you realize you still had empathy for this guy because it didn't feel like he was making it up it felt like he had come to believe it himself and these things fit and it was not a conscious choice to deceive anybody. I see. Does that make sense? Very much so. I mean, uh, yes. Any good story, even if you disagree with say the villain, the villain has to be like, they think they're right. (laughs) And that's, I'm not saying he's a villain, but in this case, he's, he wasn't doing it to defraud anybody. He was simply, he really believed this. His passion made other people believe it. Right. It's almost as if his imagination got away with him. Um, Because even though it was a horrible thing, he as an adoptee and this going back to this felt like this was something that validated him as being a part of something. Hmm. Even something as negative as, as my father was a serial killer. Yeah, it almost felt like here's evidence that I'm 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 here for a reason or that I'm important or that I have a connection to something. Right, right. That's right. what it felt like to me. Um it was very interesting though and uh I didn't realize the book was written much uh, longer ago, much longer ago. There's a there's a fun sentence. Um than I thought. Uh but I I'm, I'm really glad I watched it because uh, you know, regardless of the the untruths and the exaggerations, um, I think it was a really interesting study on the mind of an adoptee. A reminder, listeners, what the name of that documentary was? The Most Dangerous Animal of All by Gary L. Stewart. And it's on FX. I think I watched it on Hulu. Oh, okay, great. Because um, it sounds really interesting. I mean, I, I, it's it's interesting when you're watching a, a documentary in particular that's going in one direction, and then something gets thrown in there that the people they were that were making the documentary didn't expect to happen. You know, they thought they were telling yeah. this story, and then suddenly, oh wait, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not about it, that it, anymore. There were a couple of crazy coincidences that were not addressed, though, which I think leaves it up in the air. Um, one being. That and I remember this in the book. The his biological mother, who had found him, by the way, she later went on to marry a police officer in San Francisco who worked on the Zodiac case. And there was that thing with the the, the cipher, you know, with the name and all that. Yeah, the too. cipher thing. You know, they had um, other people come in and say that there are various ways. I guess that they had been able to find several names <laughs> by doing exactly the same thing using his um, uh, technique. Mm. What's what? Which Beatles album that if you play it backwards, you hear right. "I Buried Paul"? Yes. <laughs> no, isn't it? Isn't it "Paul is Dead"? Is it? But it's not really there, is it? It's just people hear it. No, I think it's there. Oh, do you? Okay. <laughs> no, I don't know. I have no I idea. Know. We're gonna have to look that up now. <laughs> I just wanted to be contrary. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do think it is a nutty coincidence. And especially in uh, in what I do for a living, it is coincidence happens a lot mm. in my line of business. Um, just, uh, gosh, just last week, I, I had a case that had been a cold case. There was endogamy and um, I was, you know, confused and I was like, I need to just put this aside and hope that a new match comes in so that makes it clearer. And one day I just happened to go back in and he didn't have any new matches or anything, but I went and looked at one of the secondary lines. There are traditionally four uh, specific lines, one for each grandparent. And the, the two secondary lines were pretty clear, but I'd not been able to connect them. Hmm. So I started working on that and... It, that's uh, things populate when you don't realize they're populating. By the way, guys, that's a um, you can come back to things that you thought you were at a dead end, and all of a sudden there's new hints and new clues, hmm. or you just see things in a different way. Um, but I was able to, in a couple of hours, identify one of his parents hmm. that I thought I was not going to be able to, and it was just way out of left field. And I was like, oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> How did I miss that before? But isn't that sort of like I do crossword puzzles and sometimes mm-hmm. I'm, I can sit there for hours and not get something and then I'll put it away and come back to it later or the next day. And as soon as mm-hmm. I look at it, I have the answer. And it's not like I've been thinking about the answer. It's yes. just, It just becomes obvious to me and it was not before. There's something about that time away from it. I don't know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Speaking of coincidence. So I was like, oh, I'm going to tell him tomorrow. This is so exciting. So before I had a chance to tell him the next day, I got a text from him saying, hey, how's it going? Was just thinking about you. And it's been months since I've talked to this guy. Isn't that funny? I I texted him saying, have you been looking at Ancestry or did you get a message from Ancestry saying new people have been added? He said, no, I was just speaking to a friend who had just been reunited with one of his parents. And so, and I was like, why does that happen more often than not? <laughs> it really does. It's like I'm. It's like opening a door or right? something. It's 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 interesting. It's an interesting energy thing. I think. Well, I mean, I, I'll just add my own two cents. Is that I, the other day, a friend of mine called me from New York. I hadn't talked to him in months, and he and I and another friend used to always go away together. And we're like, oh, we miss going away, and we used to be able to travel and all that. And I said, hey, have you talked to Eric? He goes, no, I haven't talked to him in months. I said, I haven't either. And then call waiting clicked in, and it was Eric, and I was able to put See? us on the same call, just completely out of the blue. Yeah. And it had been months since any of the three of us had spoken to one another. Yep. <laughs> so. And that's why I'm spiritual. <laughs> It's just, again, <laughs> coincidence, but still, you know, somehow. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think, I think there's more to coincidence than actual coincidence. Well, you know. Is okay. it a coincidence that we're taking a break right now? <laughs> nope, it's imperative. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Thank you for listening to Cut Off Jeans with Julie Dixon Jackson and Richard Castle. You can support us by going to patreon.com forward slash Jeans podcast. Now, back to the program. All right, we're back with story time. Yay, story time. So this week's story, and it's just one, it's it's a single episode. No part two? No cliffhangers? No part two, no. This is Emily Still, who is our Aussie friend, one of our Aussie friends who is lovely. And she's a genetic genealogist, but she's also an egg donor. And she's going to tell us a little bit about her experience in Australia as an egg donor, which is, uh, it's a very different business in Australia than it is here. I don't think we've ever had an egg donor on this, uh, well, wait a minute. Other than Renee. Other than Renee at the very beginning, yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah, Yeah. it's it's interesting. So let's give it a listen. Okay, let's do that. Hey, everybody. I have on the line from the land down under... Emma Lee Still, a.k.a. M, a.k.a. Uh, my unofficial unpaid intern who I make set things up for me. <laughs> Hi, Em. Hello. So Em is a burgeoning genetic genealogist, um, uh, but she's also an egg donor. And that's what Ooh. we're going to talk about today. Tell us how you got started doing that and then where you are okay. now. Um, so I, uh, I am an egg donor. The first person I, or couple I egg donated to um, was my friend from high school um, that I hadn't seen for a little while, but we, we'd always kept in contact. And this was always a thing that we were considering because I'm a school teacher and I don't really want children, which is a very – very weird world to navigate. Um, <laughs> but perfectly acceptable as far as I'm concerned. It's totally fine to not want children. Don't yes. pressure people into it. Please. Stop advertising babies to people who don't want them. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I had always, like, my friends had always wanted a baby. And, you know, we, we get into the age where it's like, well, this is, this is what we do now. Oh, we pump out children. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I went down a very long path. We took about a year to get through to the process of actually doing egg donation. Um, and we did it. And unfortunately we, even though I produced the eggs, I produced the goods. Um, we only got one embryo and it could have just been the, the first time that the lots of different variety, there's so many things that can go wrong in all of this. Um, so we got one embryo, one embryo called Elsa frozen umbro <laughs> we're a big disney fan and so elsa is still in the freezer now um elsa was created in april 2019 and so we are, we were devastated because one chance is it's not very mad it's not high 
Um, and there's only a 50-50 on whether it would stick. So they have to go um, through a surrogate as well. So that's a whole whole myriad of other things. But that, that embryo is still frozen. We're hopeful this coming couple of months, we will be putting that in our surrogate. So I, I actually went down this path and I, I've learned a lot. There's these beautiful Facebook groups, so supportive. They've seen everything and they know the signs of when a relationship is not working with between donors and um, they, they see they see the, the very best and the very worst of people in humanity. Like in family history, we see, we, we come across good people and we come across the, the crappy people. So I, I sought out another couple to donate to because there was issue, like there was, we were thinking that there might be issues with my own fertility, which I'd never really considered because I didn't want children. Um, and so I found a couple through Facebook, uh, yeah, don't do this, don't do this. <laughs> don't rush in um, is the big thing that everyone says. And it's like, yeah, but I know what I'm doing. And it's like, uh, no, you don't. <laughs> we all think in hindsight, we know what we're doing. And um, so I donated to another couple and that relationship soured uh, very quickly after, um, after egg pickup. Um, and it may, it leaves a donor feeling like a walking egg basket and is something that all donors will talk about, the fact that some people who, who donate um, in Australia are not paid. Mm -hmm. It's altruistic. Um, it's very different to the US system. Um, Canada is similar to the Australian system but still different. I've basically come to the terms that the relationship in the second donation soured because we did not communicate properly. Mm -hmm. I thought I had expressed my desire and need to donate to discover what was wrong with my own fertility. And I thought that my, my um, intended parents understood that. Um, and I did talk to them a lot, um, but they, they didn't quite understand. I was like, I need to know the numbers. And this is where it gets really iffy oh. because I don't have access to the numbers of embryos that are created after because I didn't pay for this to happen, basically. The, oh. it, it's the Australian law. But when you've got issues of, you know, people paying $5,000 um, to do this, people's feelings and emotions and needs get very, it, it is, there's a lot going on. And yeah. I can say that I, I honestly thought that they understood that I needed to know those numbers. And so a week after egg pickup, so they, they put the little, so they get the egg and the sperm and they mix it in the little Petri dish. <laughs> and then they, they hope that embryos are created and they monitor them for like four or five days. Okay. And so I hadn't heard from my um, recipients for a few days and I messaged them and she told me, that they had had one transfer, um, they they got an embryo. Okay. That's all she said to me. Uh huh. The emphasis on the an embryo. Right. So in my head, I'm going, I got one embryo, and we got one embryo this time. So for two weeks, I pretty much thought that one, I had wasted twenty thousand dollars of my friend's money. Because mm -hmm. that's that's the numbers you're looking at when you're doing it surrogacy. It's, it's a lot more yeah. because of the couple that they are, and then for this heterosexual couple, I they they only had to pay about five six thousand dollars somewhere there. It's very hard to estimate costs in this. You just have to have a lot of money, right? <laughs> which right. is really crap. Yeah. Um, and so when she said well, an embryo. And she didn't, she didn't say anything. And she said that they had a transfer, so they put it in. So once the embryo is in uh, the recipient in mm -hmm. Australia or in Victoria specifically where I live, um, I no longer have any control over that embryo. Okay. I do, however, have control over um, the embryos until they're put into the recipient. A few days later, she had a transfer and she called me after that and said that it hadn't stuck okay. and at this point I was feeling quite relieved because 
the relationship had soured mm-hmm. a little bit mm-hmm. and they weren't talking to me and it is very hard um it's hard to describe when somebody just drops you like a hot cake basically y- yeah well, especially when you're doing yeah. this this incredibly altruistic thing. Yeah. Uh, I, and then there's also the hormones. So yes, to boot. I, like, right. Yeah, yeah. And look, I, I can honestly say that I learned so much about myself from going through a really crappy experience. Okay. Um, yeah. And I don't regret it. I do not regret it. And I don't think that people should be shied away from having bad experiences because that's how we learn as human beings. Oh, you're so right. Yeah. However... There was the fact that I had not now produced, or in my own head, I had produced one embryo and an embryo and went, I guess I'm not having kids now. For somebody who didn't want children, it was really horrible. I just went, yeah, it's such a weird feeling because I just, I really didn't want kids. And now I kind of want kids, but I, yeah, it's a very, you ebb and flow on this. And this is why you shouldn't get a hysterectomy before you're 30 because you just, you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And so two weeks after that, I called the, the fertility specialist who I had been seeing with my previous, um, don't like my previous, my friends. Mm-hmm. I called and said, I'd, I'd really like to, you know, kind of get to the bottom of my own fertility issues. And so they arranged an appointment and I got a phone call from, from him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's like, what do you, so I, I said to him, I'm like, I only got one embryo and the first round and an embryo this time. And he's like, what are you talking about? You had a really good cycle. And he's just, so in Australia, the doctor isn't allowed to tell me this because okay. I didn't pay for this. Right. And he's just like, um, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so she not only didn't give you not- information that right. I had asked. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And uh, well, look, whether she deliberately did it or didn't do it the fact is that my feelings were hurt so i i tried to talk to her and i i said hi um so can you tell me what the numbers were so two weeks later she tells me that they got i think it was seven uh embryos and then like there's different gradings of embryos and i think she was very overwhelmed with the whole like it's a lot and so she got frustrated and then she was like there were some really hurtful things said like, um, well, you're the one who decided we were going through that fertility specialist. And I'm like, well, I just thought it'd be easier because I've already been through him. And then she said, oh, well, you're just the the person who's dragging in the paid customers. And I'm like, oh, oh, wow. Ooh. Wow, wow, wow. Yep. I mean, is she forgetting that you're, that you're getting nothing from this? Yep. And so when it comes to expenses, you're reimbursed for, you know, costs. Oh, that so, was my question. You know, okay. Yeah. So a pack of Elevate, which I've got right here, um, is about $60. Okay. And there, there were so many red flags I should have seen. So when I, I said, oh, I've just got to go get um, this other injection from the clinic because I left the other the injection at home. So I went to an appointment by myself and um, I, I forgot to take the needle that morning and because I had the appointment, I was rushing. And so I had to pay $75 at the clinic to get another um, injection okay. uh, of, of the medication. Right. And she questioned that. And I was like, well, either I missed the injection or we have to, we have to start the whole thing again. Mm. And so she did question that. And then she questioned the packet of Elevit that I bought for $65 from Chemist Warehouse. And she's like, oh, I can get that cheaper online. I'm like, well, yeah, but I need it now. Right. Um, and so all the expenses, you just keep receipts and things. And I added all the expenses up and it was, you know, about I know, $500 essentially. Okay. Um, in, in expenses of, of petrol to drive five hours sure. multiple times yeah. and back. And um, you don't get paid for time off work either. Like, I had to take sick days to, to do these things. Um, so it's a lot to put on a donor yeah. and to be questioned for those little things. And I think money was quite tight for them as well. And that's okay, but you don't get to put that on your donor. You don't get to put that on your surrogate if you're doing surrogacy either. Right. You, you've you signed up to an obligation that you're going to look after your donor. Right. And I was sending my my friends, um, my friend, because uh, we have a group chat, I was sending her a picture of a screenshot of 
of something that she had written to me and I accidentally sent it to her. To the couple? Yep. <gasps> yeah. I, oh, uh, no! Yeah. I know. Oh, no. Look, things were bad before this and it just got bad. How did she react? <sighs> Angry. Oh, Angry. Oh, livid boy. responses. Wow. So also there's all these Facebook groups yeah. where you can go and like, like the DNA and group. Vent. Um, and you can vent. Mm -hmm. And she vented on a Facebook group that my other IPs were on. <laughs> oh, jeez. And, um, yeah, she wrote some really nasty things about me. Oh used my, my name, outed <gasps> me as a donor and, and <gasps> said, this donor, it like, has ripped us off. And, uh, oh. and then I sent a message and I just said, I'm going to, like, rescind consent to use the embryos. Mm -hmm. until we have a sit down and have a chat and that's all i uh -huh. sent and then then i got blocked and then i got yeah i got i got messages from so she had been on that fa on facebook and just absolutely railroading me yeah. and then i start getting all these messages from um admins for these groups so these are women who have, have donated multiple times they know the process they know the stories mm -hmm. and they're like are you okay and what's happening? Like, she seems she's going off tap here. Rescinding consent is very, it's not something, you, like, I didn't do it automatically either. Right. I waited three days. I gave her three days to calm down from the fact that I'd sent that message by accident. And right. I just went, all right, she's, she's allowed to have a, a time. People are entitled to make mistakes. Yes, yes. Um, and I had fully, I just wanted to sit down and have a chat with them and make sure we were on the same page before. Essentially, I gave these people the ability to have children. So the rest of those embryos were still, uh, if, if you had yeah. not rescinded your consent, they could have used them. They could have, they could have used them. So, okay. um, Do you know how many I, there were? I think there might be about five left. Okay. Okay. So they are currently frozen, and if they stop paying the rent on freezing them, oh, okay. um, they are left on a counter to defrost, and that's it. Are um, you allowed to? Are you allowed to pick it up and not not without? Hold on, don't don't give me. I won't. The so I, I am yeah the husband. Oh, I'm because it's his to... because it's his sperm. Yeah, gotcha. so it's fifty fifty. Gotcha. So the other thing is that when when she called up to get results and things, they couldn't give her certain thing certain information about me. I went and saw a police officer after all this happened because I was very distraught at the fact that they had my address and. He was a truck driver, so mm. not a big stretch for him to do a drive like that because they're angry at me. Yeah. So I went and saw the local policeman, which in my town is, you know, a kid, <laughs> the kid I taught in year seven. Wait, did you say <laughs> local dad. local policeman? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so There's only one there's, policeman? Yeah. Oh, my God. It's a very small town, Julie. Very, <gasps> very, very, very small town. And I, that's where I got the question about the fact of, like, Oh, well, how much do you get paid for this? Ah. And um, and I'm like, it's nothing. You can't get paid for it at mm -hmm. all. And he's like, why would you do it? Mm -hmm. It's like because the ability to have a child is something that there's so much society pressure on. Yeah. Um, especially for women. Like, there's not as much for men. And he's like, all right, I'll just look them up on the computer. <laughs> he figured out who they were, and he's like, okay, all right, I yeah. I, and he got roughly their background. He didn't tell me any of this information because, like, he's a police officer. Right. But I, I roughly knew what I was dealing with, and it, it made me at ease because I didn't, I didn't suspect that they were, they were like criminals or whatever. Right. Because I don't, I didn't know these people, and I'd like people to learn from my mistake on this one. So, oh, so they, they haven't used the embryos because they're not allowed to. At some point, they will call me and tell me that they have been destroyed. I have asked about it. I'm sure that they've learned a lot. I do think that they've been blacklisted from a lot of the Facebook groups mm. um, for treating their donor. And that happens. Sure. Like, yeah, so uh, they do blacklist people. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're being very kind, giving her the benefit of the doubt. 
um, and taking, yeah. and taking some of the of the blame yourself. But um, her she feelings sounds like are a mess. valid. Yes, yeah, as we've said, one hot mess. Yes, and look, I've been a hot mess too. I'm, I know I'm not the best at times. Yeah, I'm like, oh wow, I was real crap then. But you're the uh. one that's doing. But you're the one that's that's helping them. You're the one who's, yeah. who's sacrificing. Yeah. your literally your body for these people. Yeah. <laughs> so. Look, I had planned on donating again because that two weeks of not of not thinking I could have kids and then being told I was lied to, mm. I couldn't imagine somebody being told that they're just not going to have kids. I, I, it's so heartbreaking. Yeah. Um. So I had planned to donate through the clinic, um, as a clinic donation, not to a couple because I just. Oh. I, I didn't want to do it again. So I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to give someone else the chance. And because of that, having so much DNA as well, <laughs> there's no way in hell they're not going to realize who I am. <laughs> my DNA. It's like everywhere. Every, every one of my family members is tested and it's all over the place. Right. Like I, I decided that I would do clinic donation. I don't re- recommend it for people who haven't done their DNA or um, are just trying to, to basically, you know, father or mother a bunch of children. So I moved to Tasmania and I donated to the clinic down there in the middle of COVID. Hmm. Um, so that was like June. However, Tasmania was really free of COVID by that stage. So we were really lucky. And um, so I did a clinic donation, which has been split in two. And so there'll be two recipient parent um, oh, families. Okay. Um, and I don't get to choose them. That's that's fine. But I did go, uh, go for um, if they wanted to contact me earlier, mm-hmm. that they could. Yeah. So I donated to this clinic. And then after that, I was like, you know what, I, I'm going to give it another go and I'll try and find some IPs um, because – I just like, I, there's limits on how many times you can donate. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not, I'm going to go again. I think I'm I'm not going to take, I'm going to take it really slow. I got burnt once. Mm. And so then I found this beautiful couple and they're just, they're just the nicest. Like we're friends now. It's been four months, but egg pickup is tomorrow. So Right. Yeah. So you Um, just took your last injection? Uh, right. Yeah, last night. So you have to take a trigger so that you ovulate or don't oh, ovulate, and gosh. then you. Yeah, it's a lot. This this round has been really good. I wouldn't do this if if the medication made me feel really really awful. Yeah. Um, I'm really lucky uh, that that I I am good at this. But if if I'd done this and I'd had a really awful experience the first round, I, there's no way I would do it again. Right. But I am really lucky. Right. I'm also really lucky because I know my genetic fan, like my genetics, and yes. I know through Prometheus, like I know that I'm not passing on really awful genetic things. Right. Um, that right. that we know of. Yeah. That we know of because science only knows what it knows at one point. I love that. I, I've decided to do this. I I don't know whether I'll donate again after this. Um, I'm hopeful, maybe. Yeah. But I I do think that I'm lucky because I know my genetics and because I've DNA tested that future child will find me. They mm-hmm. will know their story. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it's coming from a good place. Yeah. Um, whereas the second donation, I if a child was born in that and was raised in that, I. I would feel a lot of guilt. Yeah, you dodged a bullet there, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's good that you're there, that you're looking at the bright side and seeing, you know, that yeah. you learned something from it. But um, and I think the outcome is the best possible outcome for you. For, yeah. for your cliffhanger, Julie. Yeah. Um, there's no cliffhanger. <laughs> this is one episode. No, no, no. There's a cliffhanger because, okay, so okay. the first round I did. Yes. We got 16 eggs. Okay? Uh-huh. Um, from about 22 follicles. So usually only half of them will have an egg in them. Okay. From the second donation, Mm -hmm. we got 15. Okay. From the third donation, we got 19. Uh Uh-huh. And then 16 made it to the freezer, which is why we could split it in two. Gotcha. And then tomorrow (laughs) is the next one. Yeah. Okay, so so then... There was a lot of follicles, I'm not going to lie. Uh-huh. I, I took a picture as well. But cliffhanger is, how many eggs is she going to produce? <laughs> and you'll know tomorrow, right? 
Uh, yeah, I will know after surgery. Emily still. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your story and your perspective to the listeners about egg donation. You are most welcome, Julie. Okay. Thanks, wow. Emily. That was fun. Okay, so she did leave a bit of a cliffhanger. and um, You promised no cliffhangers, Julie. <laughs> there is no cliffhanger. I'm going to tell you. she. So she went and she did the egg retrieval. And uh, she was very excited because uh, from listening to it, you know, she was actually concerned that maybe she wasn't as fertile as she thought she was. Uh, but she ended up getting 26 eggs. Wow. And 13 were fertilized, which is a record for her. So, um, yay. Incredible. <laughs> and, and talk about coincidence. I just watched <laughs> that Warner Brothers Looney Tune cartoon with Prissy, my egg. You know what I'm talking about? No. She's, oh. <laughs> oh gosh, yes. Yeah. She's like vaguely. A, she's like an older um an older bird and she and the uh, younger women birds are saying, "Oh, Prissy can't lay any eggs. She's too old." And That's so, so sad. <laughs> and then someone puts one underneath it, remember? And puts an egg yes, underneath her. Yes, I do. And she protects it and it's so cute and then finally it <laughs> And her thing is, she goes yes, and then That's right. and then the egg um, at the end hatches, and it looks just like her, and and someone says, "Oh, you really were Prissy's egg," and he and it goes yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so wow. this is where my mind goes when we talk about Good egg, times. egg of donors. Of course, it does. Warner Brothers cartoons. <laughs> yep. Hey, I guess on that note, I'll just tell <laughs> all my tell everybody I'm a Looney Tune apparently, but I'm also Richard Castle. I have a website, richardcastle.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Castle Songs, and I literally just joined Instagram for the first time, and you can probably follow me on there as at Castle Songs as well. We also need to announce that uh, this is the end of season two. Already? Yes, yes, it is. My goodness. Episode 12. We're doing 12, season, 12 episode seasons now. We're going to give ourselves a few weeks off yeah. before we come back. I am freezing the Patreon page for November so that... Nobody, so we're not taking any uh, donations. From oh, anybody good. Okay, in November. sure. Um, but we'll keep the Facebook page going. Uh, feel free to, you know, let's keep talking, you guys. Till then, Julie, tell them how they can reach out to you. Send me an email at julesjackson at cutoffjeans.com. You can find the podcast on Twitter at cutoffjeanspod. You can find me on the Twitter at julesjackson with two O's. And you can find our Facebook page, Cutoff Jeans Podcast, on Facebook. I request to join. Tell me why. And boom, you're in. And everybody out there listening, we hope that you have a good uh, month and a good Thanksgiving. We will see you uh, next month in December. And Julie, until then, what can you tell them? As always, the truth is in your genes. (laughs) 